Salim Rezai here, and in the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about why hyperoxia is so bad. Now, many providers and healthcare workers, and I'm guilty of this as well, place oxygen on patients as a way to overcome hypoxemia or patient comfort. We know that in STEMI patients, for example, many of us have learned the mnemonic MONA, right? And that is morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. But it's important to think about oxygen as a drug because just like any drug, oxygen has side effects. Specifically, hyperoxia can be in a prolonged format, can give direct lung toxicity, can cause peripheral vasoconstriction, it can increase production of reactive oxygen species. So with that, I want to talk about four trials that have looked at hyperoxia and why that's so bad. Now, the four trials we're talking about are the oxygen ICU trial, the soccer trial, the IOTA trial, and finally the ICU rocks trial. So let's go through these one at a time. So the oxygen ICU trial was published in JAMA 2016. It was a randomized clinical trial of patients admitted to the ICU, and they looked at conservative oxygen, which they said uh, oxygen saturation of 94 to 98% versus standard conventional oxygen, which was oxygen saturation of 97 to 100%, just over 400 patients. And what they showed is that in patients where we try to achieve that 97 to 100%, we increase mortality and we increase shock. The soccer trial, which was published in the European Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2016, was a randomized clinical trial performed in Sweden. This was normoxic STEMI patients, and they got randomized to either 10 liters per minute of oxygen versus room air until PCI was completed. This was almost 100 patients, and what they found is there was no difference in myocardial injury or infarct size. The IOTA trial, published in The Lancet 2018. Now, this was a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at liberal versus conservative oxygen. This was 25 randomized clinical trials with over 16,000 patients with critical illness. And what they found is is that in hospital mortality, 30-day mortality, and mortality at longest follow-up were all increased with liberal oxygen use. And the number needed to harm for each of those, mortality 143, 30-day mortality was 125, and overall long-term mortality was 100. The last and most recent trial was the ICU ROCKS trial published in New England Journal of Medicine 2019. This was a randomized clinical trial of 1,000 patients requiring mechanical ventilation in the ICU. They compared conservative oxygen, which was targeting for an oxygen saturation of 90 to less than 96%, compared to what they usually target, which was an oxygen saturation between 90 to 97%. Not a huge difference there, but there was definitely separation between the two groups. And what they found is there was no difference in ventilator free days or mortality at 90 days or 180 days. So given the absence of harm, I think the conclusion was is we should just be weaning FiO2 as quickly as possible for mechanically ventilated patients. So putting all those trials together, the bottom line here is that in critically ill adults, we should avoid hyperoxia as this increases mortality potentially, and we should be aiming for oxygen saturations of 94 to 96% in these patients and stop targeting these 99 to 100% ranges that we have become accustomed to targeting. And this is just a summary of what each of those trials showed us. The two ICU trials showed that hyperoxia is bad, and in the STEMI and the mechanical ventilation, we found no difference. So if we have two trials that show harm and two that don't, then we're going to err on the side of being conservative and realize that oxygen is a drug and that hyperoxia is potentially a bad thing. So again, hyperoxia bad thing for our patients, especially in prolonged hyperoxia. So we should be targeting for 94 to 96% in these patients. And so that includes our STEMI patients. If they have an oxygen saturation above 92 to 94%, don't put oxygen on them because it potentially could be a bad thing.
So now for logistics, how would you go about increasing or decreasing oxygen for your patients? So some people would advocate for starting on the low end and then kind of increasing in a stepwise fashion. Some people would advocate for starting on the high end and starting to wean down much like we do with mechanical ventilation. I'm more of a start on the low end and move our way up, but you're not wrong if you start at the high end. So what are our possible options here? So we have nasal cannula, we have a simple face mask, we have a venturi mask, and then we have a non-rebreather mask. So let's take a look at each one of these. So nasal cannula can typically be run from one to six liters per minute. Obviously you can go higher, but it starts getting uncomfortable for the patient. As a general rule of thumb, and this is not an absolute, for every one liter that you add to your flow, you're basically adding 4% plus room air. So if room air is 21%, for every liter you add, add another 4% to that. Now this is also gonna be dependent on the what's going on with the patient, uh, what's their respiratory rate, what kind of tidal volume are they pulling. So this is not an absolute rule, but just as a kind of poor man's or woman's method of determining what you're actually doing for your patient, for every liter that you add, add 4% to 21%, and that's what you're actually giving your patient. For the simple face mask, these uh, rates can go actually a lot higher, six to 12 liters per minute, and this will get you an FiO2 of about 35 to 60%, so definitely better than room air. Venturi masks typically use an adapter, and that adapter can be adjusted, and depending on what adapter you put on or how you adjust the adapter, depending on what type of Venturi mask you have, this will get you anywhere from 24 to 60%. And the key here is that simple face mask compared to Venturi face mask, pick one or the other. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other. Whatever you have on your service, go ahead and use it. To me, these are basically equivalent. And then finally, non-rebreather mask, which can get go all the way up to 10 to 15 liters per minute. And really, for those of us who use non-rebreather masks, we know that we can actually turn that sucker all the way up to flush rate, which gets us closer to 50 to 60 liters per minute. And this will get us something close to 100% FiO2. Not exactly 100%, but very, very close to. Now, I'm a very visual person, and I wanted to kind of put pictures of what each of these looks like so that you could see nasal cannula compared to a simple face mask compared to a venti mask compared to a non-rebreather. So now you can see what each one of these devices looks like.